Well, welcome to our panel discussion on choosing a journal and communicating with editors. I'm Pete Marbay, I'm a quality control editor here at American Journal Experts, which is a division of Research Square. And I'll be presenting later on choosing best journals and avoiding predatory journals. Uh, I'd like to briefly introduce each of our panelists before we begin. So first, Julie Nash, senior partner at J&J Editorial and president of the International Society of Managing and Technical Editors, will present on six things to consider before hitting submit. Next, Jennifer Dugas Ford will be presenting remotely, and she's a academic editor at American Journal Experts, and she'll be presenting on communicating with editors. I'll deliver my presentation, and then Chrissy Prater, Senior Product Development uh, Coordinator at Research Square, will present on considering time constraints yours in the journals. Uh, Chrissy has recently set up a successful new independent peer review system, Research Quality Evaluations by Research Square, that's proven to speed up the review and publication timelines for sound research for uh, open access journals, for sound open access journals. Finally, Jennifer Fricker, Co Copy Editing Services Coordinator at J&J Editorial, and Kirby Snell, who will join us soon, <laughs> Copy Editing Client Manager at J&J Editorial, will co-present on the post-acceptance to publication process. I also want to introduce Teresa Somerville, who will be handling questions as they come in through chat. Trust me, she is over there. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all, especially those of you who have stayed up very late at night, or those of you who have woken up very early in the morning to join this presentation. Uh, I really do appreciate that extra effort. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Julie. Thanks, Pete. I got the clicker there. Got it? Ah, there we go. Um, thanks, Pete. As, as Pete said, my name is Julie Nash, and I am uh, wearing two hats today in my presentation. So the first, I'll talk a little bit about ISMTE, just as it relates to my presentation and kind of the organization we are of managing and technical editors, and in addition, uh, my role at J&J &J Editorial as well. So first, um, with ISMTE, we are a society of managing editors, and one of the primary jobs for a lot of managing editors is running editorial offices. So we're a society of the people who do take in original research, check papers in, um, really enforce the rules um, as far as the author guidelines. We look for reviewers for editors. We help the editors through the whole process. So as I'll mention later, those for a lot of researchers are the people to know. Those are the folks that are going to be able to answer questions. They're going to be able to help through the process, deal with with any technical technical issues so I wanted to mention my, mention my involvement with that society first and then second as senior partner at J&J editorial we are a company of um, folks who run and copy edit it copy edit and do production services and system support for journals as well so we have a lot of managing editors in our office who do the very process that I'll be talking about so I wanted to, to mention that I myself have been working in editorial offices for journals for more than 20 years which seems like a very 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 long time to me at this point in time um, so I've worked on probably about a dozen different journals at different times but I'm currently the managing editor for movement disorders which is a journal that's published by Wiley. So I'll be referencing some, um, some things that I've seen uh, with that journal in particular since that's my most recent experience. So you want to submit your paper to a top journal and you don't want to make any mistakes in the submission process. And this is something that we get a lot of questions about in our editorial offices on what exactly is important, what do the editors care about, um, what do I need to know when I submit. And what I'd like to do is go through sort of the top six things that I think are very important or just tips to try and help researchers, help submitters um, make that initial submission process the most successful that it can be. 
Okay, so the first is going to seem really, really obvious, um, but you would be amazingly surprised. So read the author instructions. So I will reiterate it again, read the author instructions. So if the authors, if, if the editors say that they want the the, you know, the copyright form submitted with the initial submission, do that. If the editors in the instructions for authors say that they want all the figures in the separate file, do that. Um, we get a lot of, of people submitting to us that come in with questions that think a lot of those things are negotiable. And I think that as journals have gone along, the requirements for authors, especially at initial submission, are getting easier, and a lot of journals are trying to require the least amount possible. So if they do ask in a checklist for you to complete certain things, that would be, I would definitely recommend doing that. It will help not only the first impression of the manuscript with the editors, but it will also um, ensure that the paper is processed through to the editors more quickly. Because often what happens is if those things aren't completed, it gets pushed back out to um, you as the author um, or to the researcher to make those changes before it's going to move forward. And as we know, all know in publishing, time is so valuable. And so the quicker, the easier you can make that happen, um, it, it will be beneficial to both you and to the editorial office because it means we don't have to send it back to you with a whole list of requirements. So that would be, and I will say it again, read the author instructions. <laughs> So the second tip that I have is to contact the editorial office before submitting if you have any questions. So as managing editors and editorial assistants, it is our job to provide that level of customer service to answer any questions that you have. If there's something in the instructions that isn't clear, if you have a particular image that you're having a hard time uploading, um, call us, email us. Um, make sure to get that, answer, that question answered before. So again, to save yourself time of, you know, kind of guessing and putting it in and then it, it not being correct. So I highly recommend contacting the editorial office. So if you're personal friends with the editor-in-chief or a particular editor on the journal, I might say go ahead and write them an email. Um, most of the time I would not recommend doing that. So, and the reason for that is, is that some editors love to have constant chit chat with authors um, and to be able to provide advice. But most of the editors over the years that I've worked with find that to be kind of irritating. They find that they have a lot of other things going on and constant emails from authors asking questions just kind of gets in their way. So I would not recommend contacting an editor in chief directly unless you happen to know them. Contact the editorial office. So, on most journals, that editorial contact is going to be on the masthead or in the journal or on the website. So look for that person. Sometimes it's a personal email, sometimes it's a journal email. But certainly feel free to ask questions. You are not going to bother us or annoy us in any way. So tip number three. And this is one that, again, kind of like the instructions for authors, you would be amazed how many times this happens. But if you have submitted your manuscript to a journal and it happens to not be accepted in that journal and you're on your next journal down, make sure to edit that manuscript in the cover letter to reflect the journal that you're currently submitting to. So we get and have over the years gotten enough, many, many submissions um, where the cover letter is still directed to the editor of Annals of Neurology as opposed to the editor of Movement Disorders. It's still formatted for a previous journal. So make sure to correct the style because it's a small, at least in our field, it's a very small community and editors can tell right away that something's been shopped around. And certainly everyone knows that that happens, but they want to make sure that you're committed to the journal of which you're submitting to. And it can, um, it will definitely uh, not help you in any way. And, then, and I've had editors that said, you know, I think if they submitted that and they were that sloppy, it's going to get rejected right away. So be super careful as you're moving. Um, technology certainly makes it easier to move uh, submissions around, especially if you're not doing a direct transfer from another journal. Um, make sure to, that, that all that information is clean when you're doing that submission. 
So tip number four, so research the journal you're submitting to. And, and this doesn't mean that you need to memorize the editorial board or know everyone involved, but if you're submitting, in our case, to movement disorders, you'll want to look at, you know, what kind of articles we accept. What, where does your submission fit? So we get a lot of submissions that are case reports that people submit as letters but we don't accept case reports. So they're just trying to fit it in. So we don't accept case reports if they're called an article. We don't accept them if they're called a review article. We don't accept them. So people try and force those, those articles in. So make sure that what your uh, submission is fits to the journal that you're trying to submit it to. So there are lots of journals that accept case reports in the movement disorders field. So it would be better, you'd be better suited looking elsewhere. So, so research, know that what you're submitting is going to fit into the destination journal that you've selected. Check your work before hitting submit. So oftentimes in most of the submission systems these days, it gives you a last step. So it gives you the point to look over the proof before you submit it and make sure that everything looks the way you would like it to. Um, it is super easy to bypass that step and just hit submit. Um, but we would caution people to take it take an opportunity to click into that PDF, look at the figures, look at the references, make sure everything has populated the way you intended it to. It is your last opportunity to give it a second glance before submitting it to the journal. And I would highly recommend doing that because we have a lot of cases of papers that we end up having to send back for correction could have been caught um, by the authors at that step. So we would highly recommend doing that. Again, it's a time saver. It's sometimes a first impression um, bonus. If, you, if your figures are all over the place and they aren't in the correct order and such, uh, oftentimes editors will certainly send it back. And sometimes I've had editors that will reject it because again, they don't like that sort of careless look that the manuscript has. And so finally, find an editor or a colleague or a friend to edit your paper. So um, there are certainly, and we talk about, I'm sure we'll mention later, a lot of language editing services that are out there. Um, some journals, uh, some journals, but also some departments have budgets for that, and that's great. Certainly take advantage of that, especially if English is not your strongest language. It will help you in the, in the long run. Um, but again, for movement disorders, we often tell um, authors, find somebody in your department that it do is strong in English and have them read it through. Have them make sure that it is saying what you intended it to say. And, and similarly to some of the other points, it's a first impression thing. Um, certainly there are journals out there that reject for language issues and they just, if they can't determine if the science or the research is solid, it's not worth their time to spend a ton of time reviewing it and convincing reviewers to do so. So um, trying to keep make sure that the paper is in as good of English as you can get it in prior to submitting, I would highly recommend. So, so that's my presentation and I look forward to questions at the end. Thank you, Julie. And now we'll turn to our remote colleague. Um, Jennifer is gonna present in just a moment. And I'm gonna turn this off to avoid any echo from the remote. Are you ready? Can you hear me? For um, by all means. Okay. okay. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. Hi. I'm Jennifer Dugas Ford. I'm an editor at Research Square. In my previous professional life, I was a freelance editor and grant writer for several years, during which I had a great deal of success in helping authors to publish and fund their work. I found that authors need to communicate with their editors at several points along the path to getting published. So here I'll cover some of the communications that you might have with the editor of a journal. So this includes the pre-submission inquiry, if you make one, uh, the cover letter, the post-submission revisions, and rejection. So communicating with a journal editor can be tricky because your correspondence with them is very important to determining whether your paper gets published. 
There are many legitimate reasons to contact a journal editor, but you should always keep in mind that journal editors are incredibly busy people. So the trick is to contact them at the right time for the right reason. It helps to keep in mind who journal editors are, what their goals are, and how those goals are aligned with your own objectives so that you can communicate with them most effectively. Editors are trained in science and are likely to have PhDs and may have postdoctoral experience. So you should therefore consider them colleagues, professional colleagues, and use a professional tone in all of your communications with them. Depending on the journal, an editor might be considering manuscripts from a wide range of research topics, and they might therefore not be completely familiar with the specific context of your work. So this is something to keep in mind when writing your cover letter, which I'll cover in a minute. Um, first, so pre-submission inquiries. One time you might contact a, an editor is pre-submission if you're not sure whether your manuscript will be appropriate for publication in their journal. When you submit a manuscript to a journal, you're often required to make a promise not to submit that paper elsewhere until the journal makes a decision. So if you're not sure whether your choice of journal is correct, you can ask an editor directly whether the journal might be interested in publishing your work. However, before doing so, you should do some homework to make sure that you're not asking something that you could find out on your own somewhere else. So you should, for example, be sure to do a search of back copies of the journal to find out whether they have published on your topic or subjects very close to it. One benefit of the pre-submission inquiry is that it allows you to query multiple journals to gauge which one might be most likely to send it out for review. A pre-submission inquiry should contain the same content you would include in the cover letter, which I will cover next, um, in addition to your abstract. If you don't hear back about a pre-submission inquiry within a few days, you can follow up, but sometimes it's best to just submit your journal if you've chosen one carefully. If more than one journal responds favorably to your work, um, be, be sure to inform the editor of the journal that you do not submit your article to. So like if you submit to multiple journals, you know, if you don't submit to one of them after submitting a pre-submission inquiry, definitely let them know that you're not submitting to their journal. This is just a professional courtesy and it'll leave a favorable impression of you that might help you later if you submit a paper to them later. Um, if you do decide to submit to a journal that you submitted a pre-submission inquiry to, include that information in the cover letter when you do submit your paper. So the cover letter. Your cover letter is the first and best opportunity that you'll have to directly convey to the editor why the work you're presenting is significant to their journal, to your readers, to everyone who's going to see this paper. Your cover letter should be no more than two pages long and should cover several important questions. So first, what is the major question addressed in the paper and why is it important? Why do your results matter to the field or related fields or even to the general public? How are your results novel? How did the scope and significance of the work that you're presenting align with the journal's mission and audience? This is particularly important because journals have different goals. So you want to make sure that the journal knows that you're applying to them specifically because you believe that your manuscript is appropriate for their journal. If it's been more than a month since your initial submission and you haven't heard anything from the journal, it is appropriate to contact the editor to ask for a status update. Being as polite and brief as possible is the best way to get a quick response. Um, one thing to check with a uh, when you're writing your cover letter is a, the journal guidelines. So for example, they might require you to include text stating that you've not submitted the paper elsewhere. And finally, address the cover letter to the specific editor who is most likely to be reading it. This is another professional courtesy and a personal touch that indicates your desire to publish in this specific journal. And you should make absolutely sure, as the previous speaker said, that when you change your cover letter, if you're submitting to another journal, make absolutely sure that you change the name of the editor and the name of the journal just to keep that personal touch and to keep that level of professionalism. So post-submission. Few manuscripts are accepted without requests for revisions or further experiments. So if your paper goes out to review, you'll need to communicate with the editor regarding the decision letter and the reviewer's comments. If the decision is not favorable or the reviewers are more critical than you expected, it can be really difficult to respond calmly and respectfully. So if your paper is accepted pending revisions, congratulations, you'll usually need to reply to the editor with a cover letter that addresses each of the points the reviewers made. The reviewers may have made suggestions about missing data or errors or references you missed, or they might ask you to change the way that you frame your questions or interpret re your results, or they may ask you to rephrase how do you describe a particular condition or technique or population. In each of these cases, you need to reply in a point-by-point -point manner to each issue, even if different reviewers bring up the same point, you need to respond to all of them individually. If you make revisions to the manuscript, definitely include the page and line numbers of revised text and your explanation of why you made these changes so that the editor can review your changes as efficiently and effectively as possible. Make it easy for them to see what you did and why you did it. 
Some widely used formats for these responses are, we appreciate that the reviewer has pointed this out. We've revised the text in accordance with the reviewer's suggestion as follows, or we regret that we were unclear about this issue. We've revised the text in question as follows, or we appreciate the point that the reviewer is making. However, we believe that our data support our conclusion. In this cover letter, we've included the following additional data not included in the manuscript due to space limitations to support our conclusions. These are all legitimate replies that you can make to, you know, either say, yes, we respect what the reviewer says and we've made changes in accordance, or we respect what the reviewer says, but we're gonna stick by our point and this is why. If the reviewer's comment is about a lack of clarity, then consider having someone not involved in the writing of the manuscript read the revised draft to, you know, to, to make sure that your changes eliminate the confusion that was raised. The reviewers might also ask for additional experiments or controls. In this case, you do need to consider the legitimacy of their request, but you also have to keep the resubmission deadline in mind because it can be really short, sometimes you know, a couple of weeks or 10 days, which is not very long to perform you know, a, a large set of experiments. So you may only be able to plan and perform a subset of the requested work. If that happens, then you need to communicate to the editor your reasons for excluding some of the revisions. If your paper is rejected, you should avoid calling or emailing the editor until you've given yourself you know, a little time to fully digest the decision. The last thing that you should do is respond to a manuscript rejection emotionally or defensively. Um, if you believe that you have grounds for appealing, that's totally fine and it is possible to do, but you might consult with a colleague to get an outside view, explain to them what was told to you by the editor, what were the reasons the reviewers didn't want your paper to be accepted, and then see if there's a way of responding to that you know, with scientific evidence and scientific support. If you do send an appeal letter to an editor, you should stick to the scientific reasons for why the journal should publish your manuscript or why the reviewer's criticisms weren't fully justified. So don't comment on the time and effort you put into completing the manuscript because that, that kind of personal appeal is not going to persuade them. In the end, the most important thing to keep in mind is to be professional at all times. You need to treat the editor and the reviewers as professional colleagues, no matter how much you disagree with them. Editors might see a lot of papers, but that does not mean that they won't remember someone who is rude or discourteous. So being polite and professional in all of your communications, even following a rejection can't hurt you, and it may actually help you if you submit another paper to the same editor later. They will remember that, and they will definitely remember rudeness, so always be professional. All right, thank you very much, and I definitely look forward to questions. And I'd like to turn it over now to Jennifer and Kirby from J&J &J Editorial. I'm just clicking. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kirby Snell, and my uh, colleague Jennifer Fricker and I are from J&J &J Editorial, um, and we work in the copy editing division there. So, um, again, we this is. Um, you know, we, we see your papers after they have been accepted, you know, helping to make sure that everything is ready and clean and good to go for publication. Uh, so the post acceptance production process is where we fit into the, um, the whole picture. Um, so we just wanted to give kind of an overview of what that process looks like, because again, that's a part of the um, whole story that, um, you know, authors aren't really as heavily involved in and may not really have as much of an idea of what goes on or how that relates to them. Um, so just to start with a kind of a, a bird's eye overview of that process. Uh, and again, every journal, every publication is different. So some of these steps, you know, some journals may do them in a slightly different order or combine some of these different stages. Um, but just to give kind of a general idea of what you can expect your paper to go through after it's accepted. Uh, so, of course, you start with submitting your paper, going through peer review, revision, uh, getting it accepted. Congratulations, you're in. Um, and after that, your paper goes, moves from the editorial stage into article production. And so it gets passed over to the production staff. Uh, and this is just kind of a, a real basic rundown, again, very um, kind of just the skeleton of the different steps that your paper might go through. Uh, it would be, the manuscript would be logged in, again, sent over to the production 
uh, the production team, uh, a manuscript preparation step, which might include things like basic formatting of the paper, uh, making sure things like um, funding information and disclosures, all of that information is all in order and everything is where it needs to be. Uh, and then moving into copy editing, which is what Jennifer and I do, and that's, again, just making sure the language is clean and everything, you know, all the grammar and all of that good stuff is cleaned up. Uh, making sure that the paper adheres to the journal's style. Uh, and then from there, you would move into composition or typesetting, so the paper gets laid out as it will actually appear on the screen or on the page. Uh, and then you would move into proofreading, proofing or proofreading, um, which is kind of the last step to look at the paper in its final form to check for any you know, final mistakes or typos or any formatting errors that might have come up. Make sure everything looks clean, make any necessary corrections, and then get approved for publication. Uh, so just some tips to prepare your manuscript, uh, going back even before you submit, uh, things that you can kind of keep in mind and do to make sure that, you know, just to kind of make sure that that process goes as smoothly and quickly as possible. Um, and these are things that won't only just help in the that production process, but can also help make sure that peer review and the whole front end of the process also goes a little uh, easier. Uh, so first of all, you might want to consider English language editing, uh, especially if English is not your native language, um, you know, is sound or as significant as, you know, your research might be if the language is not, you know, as as clean as it can be, that might be a barrier to, you know, getting through peer review uh, and, again, getting through, you know, actually getting the paper ready to publish. And so that might be something to consider if, if you feel like you might benefit from that. Uh, you know, make sure you review the author guidelines and the style guide if it's available. Uh, again, you know, those guidelines exist for a reason because these are things that we hope that you can or are able to do before the paper gets to us to help make our jobs easier and, you know, eliminate any headaches for you and having to go back and forth and make sure that all of those requirements are met. Uh, again, are all required elements present in your paper um, and are all of those elements formatted correctly? Um, figure supporting information. Uh, and then something else that you might find help helpful is to look at some published articles in your target journal. Uh, how are they, how are different elements of a paper formatted? Is there anything that you could do to try to meet those requirements? And, you know, nothing fancy or very technical, just things as simple as, you know, how is an abstract laid out? Do they have specific headings or sections? And you know, does your abstract meet uh, that same format, just basic things like that, uh, that, you know, can help so that they don't have to be fixed further on in the process. Um, and then references, and I think probably anybody who works in the production end of the process would say that this is one, if not the most um, common pain point. Uh, references, there, if, as much as you can do to make them right on the front end, <laughs> the easier it will be for everyone on the back end, um, first of all, are they complete? Uh, do all of your references lead to a source that actually exists and that can be found by other people? Uh, do they match the journal's style? And are they all called out and cited within the text? Uh, and again, if as much of that as you're able to do before you submit the paper, you know, the less time we have to spend, the faster the paper can get through publication, you know, the less we have to communicate with you to try to fix these things and the, the fewer headaches there are all around. Uh, so just to jump back real quickly to uh, the overall process here, I just wanted to highlight proofing real quickly because in most cases this will be um, the primary point in this process where you as an author will be invited back in. Uh, again, this is, you know, you would receive a copy of your proof to kind of look over and just make sure that everything looks correct. Uh, and so just, to, if you haven't been through this process before, it can be helpful just to have an idea of what to expect, what you'll be looking for at that stage. Uh, you just, you know, reviewing the layout and the appearance to make sure everything is there, nothing got, you know, left out or messed up during the typesetting process. Uh, you want to make sure to confirm the accuracy of all the author information, disclosures, make sure, you know, everything is in the right place and accurate. Uh, you may have queries that were left by a copy editor or the typesetter for things that were maybe unclear as they were going through the paper that they need you as the author to address. 
Uh, so look for those questions and, you know, just do the best you can to address them as thoroughly as possible. And, you know, don't be afraid to go back to us with any questions that you may have if anything is unclear. Uh, but what you're not doing at this point is making any major revisions or significant changes to the content of your paper. Again, that's all been reviewed and vetted and approved. So at that point, it's just, you know, those minor little things. Um, and I'll pass it over to Jennifer. Well, um, thanks, Kirby. So now that we've kind of given an overview of the steps that are typically in the production process, I was going to talk a little bit about some tips for effective communication with production staff and editors during this post-accept phase. Um, so first of all, each step that we just went over typically has a benchmark that it needs to be completed by in order for the overall production schedule to be completed on time and for your article to reach its scheduled publication date. And that's the main job of the production staff that you'll be working with during this time is to make sure that your manuscript is moving through each of those steps and hitting those benchmarks. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you respond promptly whenever you're receiving questions via email or request to complete a task such as reviewing your proof as we just went over. Um, and sometimes when you're receiving these questions and requests, you might not really uh, understand the reason why you're being asked to change something in your manuscript or to complete something. But there is actually a rhyme and a reason behind those questions. Um, so typically, if you're being asked to change something related to the formatting of your manuscript, so perhaps the structure of your headings or the formatting of a list, something like that, that typically has to do with the limitations of typesetting, which is the process that creates your final PDF version, um, or XML, which is your online version of the article. Those are typically very automated, and they don't handle variations in the formatting that they're set up to receive. So those are some reasons why you might be asked those kinds of things. It also might be related to the design of the journal, just trying to make the look of your article uh, similar to the look of other articles within that journal. Um, you'll also be addressing some questions from your copy editor. And the reason behind those questions is to just kind of verify that the changes that your copy editor has made are um, not interfering with the scientific content of the manuscript. Usually copy editors are uh, enforcing a preferred style for the journal, so it might have to do with um, whether a certain term is capitalized or not, or maybe the journal prefers patient-first language. Those types of changes they might ask you to verify. Um, the copy editors are also concerned with consistency within an article, so if you've used a certain term different ways in different places, you might be asked to confirm which version is correct so that that can be made consistent throughout. And of course, seeking clarity for your readers, you might be asked to kind of reword something if it's a little bit confusing to readers. And then just a few more tips to keep in mind to keep the process running smoothly. Um, so, uh, you, especially if you're working in a speciality that doesn't have that many different journals that publish articles on that topic, you'll often find yourself publishing with the same journal more than once. Um, however, the production process might not look exactly the same as it did the last time that you published in that journal, even sometimes if that was just a few months ago. Uh, things do change quickly in the publishing industry. Um, we have a lot of technological advances and, you know, journals are always striving to improve their process and make it more efficient to increase quality control and all of those sorts of things. Um, also, the steps in the process that we've gone over, there are a lot of variations on that theme, as Kirby said, so you might not encounter exactly the same process with different journals. Um, come on. There we go. Okay, and then also sometimes you might be asked a question by production staff that you've already answered earlier on in the process, or maybe an issue is being brought up that was already resolved with editorial staff. Um, ideally, production will have access to the full submission history and be able to avoid those sorts of things, but just be aware that you might need to explain that this issue did already come up and what the resolution was in order for the process to move forward. 
There are also some times when you're going to be asked a question again because production needs to ask you to verify your answer. A good example of that is with uh, financial conflict of interest. That's typically a question that you answer on a submission form. And it's also typically a question you're going to be asked again at production because we just really need to verify that that's complete and correct and there's nothing that needs to be added to that. So finally, my main tip for communication throughout the whole process is just to remember that you are on the same team with journal staff and you're working together towards the same goal, which of course is your published article on schedule and looking its best. So, all right, thanks. Thank you, Jennifer and Kirby. And next we'll move on to, um, well, first of all, questions are listed. And one thing I wanna note, all of these slides will be available after the webinar. So you can peruse these, see the contact information, click on any relevant links, copy anything that uh, you find relevant. So this is not a one-time thing. Don't hastily uh, jot down things as we move along. So my topic is choosing journals, and I'm relying very heavily on a colleague of mine who is in charge of our journal recommendation service. So I've borrowed heavily from the webinar that she gave earlier. I am a quality control editor here at American Journal Experts, and briefly, what that means is I make sure that our editors have edited our clients' work to be within the proper scope if, and edit it to the uh, proper extent. So I may have to step in and change a few things, um, but it's basically a quality control step, and I've been doing it for a little while. I've seen nearly 30,000 manuscripts uh, since I've joined AJE, so I will be glad to answer any questions about that um, at the end of this, uh, if you're curious about our language editing services. So for choosing journals, um, well, it's a very costly process, both in time and possibly in uh, money. And this can take many months because the journal has a number of steps as our previous presenters have gone over, and it takes some time to go through your work. Also, if your work's rejected from a journal, it may be many months down the road and you have to start the process all over again. So I threw a few numbers up there to see how long the submission to acceptance and acceptance to publication rates generally are. Um, but do keep in mind, too, that there are nearly 2,000 publishers out there who are publishing about 30,000 peer-reviewed journals. And 10,000 of these are open access journals, and about 15,000 of them are in the English language. So there are many journals out there many sources and a potential for you to invest way too much time looking for the wrong journal. I hope to give you a few search tips that will help narrow that process. To that end, I've listed a few search engines and databases that, for you to consider. Uh, PubMed's wonderful if you're in uh, the clinical or biological sciences. Jane, the, uh, and do forgive me, I need to look this one up. Thank you. The journal Author Name Estimator. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, it's a wonderful source. Uh, again, it may not be the only source that you want to consider. If you have access to Google Scholar, not everyone does, unfortunately. It offers a wide range of, of scholarly articles, not all of which are peer-reviewed, but at least you have a wide scope in uh, fields, from engineering to uh, clinical and uh, biological sciences. And Journal Guide's a free service that Research Square offers that anyone may visit to find some information on various journals. So, as you're perusing these uh, sources, what do you look for? Well, you want to find articles that are similar to yours, that are directed to a similar audience. Are you targeting clinicians? Are you targeting mechanical engineers? Are you targeting molecular biologists? make sure that you're finding articles that target those people as well. And consider the scope. If you have a very general article that will apply to a number of people in the biological sciences, then you don't need to narrow it down to a very specific subfield within the biological sciences. 
as you're looking up these articles, keep a spreadsheet handy and populate it with the names of those articles, the name of the journal in which they're published, and any other relevant uh, information that you want to include. After you have, oh, I would say, at least 100 articles listed, look through them and organize that spreadsheet by journals so that you know which journals you want to target. This will help narrow down that list considerably and hopefully save you some time. But what do you do when you have those journals? Well, you want to figure out their scope. Um, is the journal something very broad? Is it trying to reach a larger audience? Or is this something that's very specific to a very small group of uh, researchers who are interested in one particular gene and one catfish that's found in one river in Southeast Asia? Um, it's very important to narrow it down as much as you can and make sure that these articles and the journals in which they are published are related to your scope. The impact's important to consider as well. How often are these journals articles cited? And I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more, so I, I'll scroll through this rather quickly. Consider the reputation of the journal as well. And this is something you can do just by asking your colleagues. Go to your advisor, go to your lab mates, Go to your friends who are seeking publication. Ask them, have they published in this particular journal? If so, what was the process like? And they may be able to provide you more information than is available on the journal's website. Consider also whether the journal's open access or is a hyper journal that has open access um, opportunities as well as traditional uh, publication. So some of the other things to consider that may not be on the journal's website, the acceptance rate. How many submissions do they receive? And of those, how many are actually published? The review speed, the time to the first decision, which is when you would know whether it's been accepted or not, and of course, the time from acceptance to publication. You'd also need to find out the publication costs, and if it's an open access journal, what are their policies? I won't spend much time on indexing, but verify whether the journal's indexed. And don't always trust the journal's site. Um, if you get to the website and it lists an indexing system that's particular to one publisher, you might want to look into these four sources as well. Um, I, or, I'm sorry, these three sources. And again, you can come back to these. I'm not going to belabor them right now. Some things to consider about the different types of publishers out there. If you're submitting to a high impact journal, keep in mind that if your work's accepted, it's wonderful. The prestige is there. You're more likely to reach more readers. You're more likely to be cited. However, you must consider that a lot of other people will be uh, submitting to that journal as well. So again, look back at the acceptance rate. Multiple disciplinary journals. If you have a topic that's very general, you may want to submit to these journals that reach a wider audience so that if you're doing something that's uh, in biomedical engineering, perhaps it will relate to both engineers and people in the biological sciences and clinicians. If your paper is very narrow in scope, look to the specialized journals, ones that are very specific to a very specific subset of uh, your field. Think about open access. Uh, journals which get your material out there quickly, make it available to a wide audience, but I'm going to cover a few of the pitfalls uh, in just a bit, so keep in mind both the pros and cons. And lastly, mega journals. Consider journals such as PLOS One. They do have um, benefits, as in your work generally gets out there more quickly, but the review process may have less editorial support, and it may be more difficult for first-time authors uh, to navigate the publication process. So the predatory journals. Uh, to avoid becoming prey to these nearly 8,000 predatory titles that publish over 400,000 works a year as far back as 2015, you have to keep a few things in mind. One is that predatory journals are as likely to originate in a developed nation as they are in an undeveloped nation. So don't assume that just because of journals uh, based in the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, wherever, um, that it is not a predatory journal. 
there are certain things you can do to um, ensure that you're not submitting to a predator. Why do you want to avoid predators? Well, there are a number of reasons. First of all, they may just take the money and run. Your work may be published alongside work that is disreputable. And other journals may not want to publish your work because that journal takes the copyright and doesn't allow you to publish that work elsewhere. And I've cited a source that I include in my references at the end here. It's a very good article pertaining to that issue. Uh, for science, the issues are that the results may not be reproducible, uh, ethic guidelines may not have been followed during the research process, and fraudulent research may be cited by other researchers and of course mislead them. So, how to avoid. Beale's list is probably the number one source, and I include one uh, web address for you. Beale's list appears on many different university sites, so it's widely accessed, widely used, and our own journal recommendation service uses it as well. Uh, the WAME, the World Association of Medical Editors, also has a downloadable file that you can um, find for yourself at wame.org. And then there are white lists. So if the journal doesn't appear in the black list, you can double check their credentials by going to the Directory of Open Access Journals, to uh, COPE, which is the Committee on Publication Ethics, or to the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. So it's a good way to check to see whether they have membership in these sources. If they do not have membership, if they do not appear on the, bla uh, the blacklist I noted, you're still taking your chances. Um, but there are other resources out there. There's a journal evaluation tool at Digital Commons, uh, a checklist at thinkchecksubmit.org. We have a uh, paid service, um, which is our rec journal recommendation service, where we'll actually do all this legwork for you. And of course, there's Journal Guide, which is a free service available through AJE. How to identify predatory journals? I'm going to go through this rather quickly uh, because I don't want to eat up too much of Chrissy's time. But probably the most obvious thing is an unprofessional website. If you go to a journal's website and you notice ads that are for something other than scientific instruments, uh, publication services, language editing services, anything related to your field or to the publishing process, it's a major red flag. So if you see a banner ad for Hello Kitty credit cards, it's probably a good sign that they're in it for the money. And they may just take your article and publish it alongside something that has to do nothing with your research. Or they just may take the money and run. So that's a major warning sign. Another one is if there are a number of errors in the titles and abstracts of their published works. Typos happen. We're all guilty of uh, missing a typo or two. But if you see repeat errors, that's a good sign that there's no uh, editorial oversight. If the content of the journal varies from the title and the stated scope. Basically, if you're trying to submit something for mechanical engineering, but the journal includes papers on love poetry in the 17th century uh, France countryside, uh, that's not a good sign. And readers who go to that journal expecting to read something on uh, that particular form of engineering will be sorely disappointed and they may overlook your article even though your article is sound and is perfect um, for that particular subject matter. Two other things to watch for. If there's no editorial board or editor-in-chief, that's a sign that there's no oversight and anything goes. Uh, anything may be published by that journal. If the editorial board is very small, or is coming soon, that may mean that you're getting in on the ground floor of a journal and you have to assess that risk. Do you want to risk that maybe this journal is legitimate or maybe it's not? I'll touch briefly on these and then um, if you notice that the affiliation is um, of a particular nation or is international, but the articles within it don't match, that's a bad sign as well. For instance, if a journal claims to be the American Journal of Anesthesiology, but the editorial board is based in Zimbabwe, 
and all the articles are um, submitted by African researchers. The research may be sound, but you, as a researcher in Taiwan, may not be reaching the U.S. Uh, audience that you were intending to reach if you were to submit to them. Likewise, if the journal claims to be the International Journal of Mechanical Engineering, and all the articles are coming from the Midwest in the United States, it's not really truly international in scope. And as a researcher from uh, South Korea, you may find that you're not reaching the audience that you want to. As an international researcher, your work may not even be considered if all the other sources are coming from the United States. So watch for that um, mismatch. And I want to touch on one that's really important. Um, this doesn't hold true for all open access journals, but if they ask for a submission or handling fee up front, definitely double check that they're not on a predatory, predatory list. Generally, you'll be asked for a publication fee after acceptance, not before acceptance. There are a few exceptions to this. And because I don't want to eat into Chrissy's time, uh, here are some sources. Uh, you can look at over your free time. And of course, if there are questions, please do come back to me at petermarbay at researchsquare.com. So without further ado, Chrissy Prater. Thanks, Pete. I wasn't trying to hurry you along. I just seriously failed at taking a drink there. Um, I should uh, say I've had the uh, honor to be a Pete's colleague and friend for a number of years now, and I wanted to say thanks for including me on the panel. Um, so. Pete mentioned uh, that I am a product developer, and so how does, how does that relate to all of this? But I'll tell you that I spend a lot of my time thinking about why does it take so long to get a paper from submission to publication, and what can we do about it here at Research Square, and how can we contribute to making that, that whole process faster and, and more useful to everyone? And so my area of expertise is really from the submission stage to that first decision stage um, that, that everyone has just been talking about. And uh, so my question is, why does that take so long? So that covers this, the, all of the pre-screening that, that uh, my fellow uh, panelists have reviewed already, as well as the peer review. Um, so everything before it gets to Jennifer and Kirby. Um, so I'm going to focus on that for a little while. Uh, so why does it take so long? <laughs> and for me, um, sort of as an operations specialist within product development, it's, it's a workflow question. And so we all know everyone wants to do research and we have a publisher parish academic culture, so that leads to a lot more research. And so research output continues to increase um, the number of journal outlets does increase, but the fact remains that most of these journals, particularly if they have an impact factor already, are dealing with unprecedented submission volumes. Um, and their traditional workflows may not be prepared to handle that. And so you find that, wow, I, I know it used to take a long time to get an answer back on my submission, but now it's taking longer and longer and longer. Uh, so that's, that's related to overall submission volumes and, and how do you handle those submission volumes and how do you do it efficiently and consistently and, and with the quality that everyone would like. Um, so that's what I spend my days doing and most of the time I'm working with the editors and publishers of uh, mid to low tier impact factor journals in the open access space and uh, specifically these journals that I work with are looking at the soundness of the research. So the research quality, not necessarily the novelty or the impact of the work. Uh, so these journals do see a lot of manuscripts that maybe aren't quite complete yet, or uh, maybe have been turned away from some higher impact factor journals because they do lack that novelty or interest angle. Um, but what that means for these journals is they have a very large submission volume to deal with. And journals, um, are aware of the increasing time to decision problem and many journals are trying to do something about that and one of those things is contacting my team uh, and we, we help them implement better workflow processes and, and we actually will process the peer reviews for them. Um, and so one of the journals that came to us recently, I know uh, 
you guys showed some statistics up there about time to acceptance and time to uh, publication. One of the journals we worked with recently, their time to first decision was 250 days. Um, so it's creeping, you know, even beyond the statistics that you, the average, you know, there's a wide range still um, uh, that's represented by that little average. So by implementing different workflow strategies, including our peer review uh, services, that journal was able to take its first decision time down to 50 days. So there is hope, everyone, there's hope. Um, so it does require the journals to, to make some changes, right, in their, in their processes, to uncomplicate them, to standardize them, to make them able to handle these higher and higher volumes that, that we'll probably continue to see, and also to maintain that quality level. So part of that's on the journal, but I want to talk to you guys and, and hear your questions really about how can you navigate that system, whether or not the journal is changing their processes or improving their processes. And what's great is a lot of the points I had written here, everyone already brought up for me. So I just get to reinforce that. And, and the two main points were follow the journal guidelines because there's this whole pre-screening step that happens after you submit. And don't be sloppy. Um, because the papers that are well done, um, even just in presentation, are the ones that move more smoothly through the system. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the scale of the problem, shall we say. So we've mentioned um, issues with declarations, such as ethics and funding and conflict of interest, and up to 50% of manuscript submissions either don't have these declarations or they aren't quite appropriate for the study that was done. Um, file issues, 30% of manuscripts can have file issues. Um, around 30, 35% of manuscripts, the, the journal can't verify who that author is, um, according to their the corresponding author email. So, you know, do things like use your institutional email if you have one, or explain that you don't have one in your cover letter, and try to use a consistent email address when you're publishing, so that that email address is is visibly aligned with your publication history, so that you have a smoother entry into journals in the future. Um, text overlap. Um, while all of us try to be original in our writing, a lot of times uh, things that we've read and things that we've heard can creep into our text and creep into our thoughts and, and that comes out in our manuscript. So take advantages of services like uh, Crossref, uh, Authenticate, um, plagiarism checkers, uh, but you'll want to tweak the settings and just look for for runs of you know, full sentence overlap, if you've accidentally done that, you'll want to take care of that because those are things that the journals go back to the authors for in the pre-screen stage or even um, the, the post-acceptance stage, sometimes you have to go back for that. And that, every single time you have to go back for something, it, it takes more time. Um, scope, do your research and all of that. Um, so yeah, don't be sloppy, get it together, and you will, you will zoom through as fast as that journal can process it. Um, so some of these journals do have backlogs, and they're working on them, so I do suggest that when you send that pre-submission inquiry, ask those hard questions. What's your average time to first decision? What's your average time from acceptance to publication? They may or may not answer you, or they may very highly qualify their answer. <laughs> <laughs> with some ifs, thens, ands, or buts. Um, but it's good to know. And, and I would encourage authors to patronize journals that are actively working on this problem if they have this problem. Um, I know a lot of authors that we work with at, at AJ Unicross Research Square are in this middle tier open access space. And those are the journals that are hit hardest by the submission volume problem. So everyone sort of has to work together. Um, in terms of getting through the second phase of pre-acceptance the, the, with the journal reviewers, getting a successful review back, a lot of times that's the, the bottleneck at a journal is they just can't find an available peer reviewer or multiple available peer reviewers. Um, and there are some things that an author can do to help themselves uh, in that case as well. So usually when an invitation is sent to a peer reviewer, what they can see right off the bat is the title and the abstract is a manuscript. So if there are obvious errors in the title or the abstract or blatantly missing information regarding the methods or the research question or the conclusions, 
it's very hard for a reviewer to judge whether or not they'll be a good reviewer of that manuscript and whether or not they can provide some advice. So that can lead to reviewers hesitating to accept the review of that manuscript and that leads to delays in the processing of your manuscript. Um, so do what you can. Again, don't be sloppy. Um, take care of things. Take advantage of, of services that are out there to help you. And whether or not, um, I can say as a native English speaker myself, I need help with manuscript editing. Um, so I always have a colleague do that for me, and it's great because I work in a place where my colleagues do that all the time. Um, but yeah, don't be ashamed to get help. Um, or don't have too much pride because I think everyone uh, could use a, several sets of eyes on their manuscript before it gets to the journal. And that's really what leads to your success through the journal process. Um, yeah, any sort of missing details and, and within the manuscript, make sure you've had a colleague look over the content of your manuscript. If your, con if your colleague has major questions, Pay attention to them and go ahead and answer them within your manuscript before you get to the journal, before you get to the peer review step. You're, you've already gone through a couple of hoops and taken care of a couple of things and that will help speed your manuscript through the process. Um, so I'll wrap it up there and I look forward to taking specific questions from everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Chrissy. And yeah, at this time we would like to open it to specific questions. Um, Teresa, if we have anything from our online community, we'll address those first since um, they don't have the opportunity to stick around here in the office after the panel's over. Could you do more? Me? Good. Okay. So I do see. Um, I'm scrolling through. We did have a question um, about a cover letter. And so someone has asked, is there something specifically that we need to show in the cover letter? Um, so um, if you guys have any suggestions about, you know, what specifically to include anything to call out, um, or maybe even things not to include, um, which would be helpful. So as far as cover letters go, um, the requirements for those are going to often be journal specific. So some journals in their instructions to authors have very clear things that they want to see that are specific to that journal. So for movement disorders, um, just as an example, they want a statement that says that there's been no ghost writing and that needs to be included in the cover letter. So I think a good cover letter includes whatever the journal is asking for. In addition, just the basic information about the authors, um, the study, make sure it's directed at the correct journals I mentioned earlier, um, and not a whole it doesn't need to be a six paragraph essay on the nature of the research. It should be simple to the point and easy for an editor to jump into and extract the information that they need to, need to get out of it. Awesome, thank you. Um, that's fantastic. Um, we also had a question about, um, you know, if you guys have actually any examples or sample responses um, when communicating with reviewers um, about any of their feedback and just, you know, if, if you have any, an example of anything, um, you know, maybe to be able to articulate that in a professional way. Um, I know I went through mine really quickly. <laughs> I'd be happy to repeat them if they want that. I know somebody asked. Sh sure, yeah, I think that would be great, Jen. Thank you. Okay, cool. I'll go slow this time. Let's see. Uh, so the ones that I suggested, ones that I used when I used to write papers, um, was we appreciate the reviewer has pointed this out. So, you know, express your appreciation. Revise the text in accordance with the reviewer's suggestion as follows, because then you're saying, you know, I, I recognize what the reviewer is saying. I have made changes that I hope will meet with their approval. Um, also, you could say, we regret that we were unclear about this issue because a lot of the times the reviewer will say, I'm not really sure 
what this particular piece of text is saying. So you want, you know, you don't want to say, I understand what you're saying. We've revised the text in question as follows. And then if you disagree with a reviewer about something, you still need to be really respectful when you're replying to them. So you say, we appreciate the point that the reviewer is making. However, we believe that our data support our, our conclusion. In this cover letter, we've included the following additional data not included in the manuscript due to space limitations to support our conclusion. Because there what you're doing is you're respecting what the reviewer is saying, you're giving a reason for why you didn't include that data in the paper, and you're providing the editor and hopefully the reviewer with the data that they need to, you know, hopefully agree with your point. So, you know, that's mostly what you want to do is respect what the reviewer is saying and reply to them. You need to reply to them in some way, whether you disagree with them or not. Thank you, Jennifer. And I just wanted to add a, another point. Uh, if you would like to see some examples of responses to peer reviewers, if you go to the Author Resource Center uh, at AJE.com, um, you'll be able to uh, search for topics on peer review. And there are a few different papers uh, presented there that address this uh, specific issue and provide you templates much as uh, Jen's provided. So thank you, Jen, for um, those specific examples. Did anyone? Great. Um, that, uh, for now, is if, if you're online and have any questions, um, if you can add those in and we can make sure to answer those. Um, for now, I think that covers um, what we've received online. So I wanted to open it up to our in-person audience and, um, and see if we have any, any questions or, or thoughts to, to add here as well. Um, it looks, it looks like we did get another one online, okay. so if I can, can take that back real quick. Um, so, um, one, another question that we received is, said, what do you think about using references from the journal that you were submitting your paper to? Does it help the acceptance of the paper in any way? It does not. <laughs> um, yeah, journals are careful about self-citation and not over-citing. Um, certainly, you can include references and, you know, editors, if, if there's relevant material that has been previously published in that journal, they would want to see that. But do not just start listing every article on that topic from that journal just because you think that might help. It um, often is not something that the, the editors are going to consider one way or another unless you've missed something. So, or if there's material in your manuscript that should have been cited that isn't, those are cases where journal editors are going to look specifically to the references, but oversighting that particular journal is not going to be helpful to you. Okay, Th thank you for that. That's very helpful. Um, we did receive another one. Um, it says, is there any benefit with special issues? So, so perhaps um, any benefit with being published in special issues? I think I may just hand the mic to Julie and let her field some of these uh, journal specific questions. Um, so I'm not sure exactly if it's intended, if it would be a benefit to publish in a special issue impact wise, um, but a lot as far as there's supplements and special issues and some journals will do supplements which are often sponsored um, and those aren't necessarily, most journals that I've worked on, the supplements still are considered by the editors, but there's maybe not peer reviewed to the same scale as the regular journal. So sometimes in different communities, those aren't looked at 
quite in the same way as the journal issue. So our journal, Movement Disorders, also does special issues that are regular journal issues or series. And those are often collected articles together, um, put together for the for the purpose of impact. So it is often a, a good thing and a, a coup to be published in something that's a special series or a special issue on a particular topic. And it'll often, at least through society journals, it'll often be promoted pretty heavily um, using social media and on the website. So it is, it is um, something that's a nice thing for many editors and uh, authors. Okay, we um, th thank you all online actually for submitting your questions. Um, this is really um, adding hopefully and helping helping everyone um, attending. So, so we do have several more. Um, one is what is the protocol when you have been offered an R and R but have decided that the journal is perhaps not the right fit for your paper? Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> Uh, so R and R, uh, assuming, refers to the ever popular revise and resubmit, um, which is uh, probably the most used decision at any journal you might throw a dart at. Um, and so the question is, what what to do if you receive a revise and resubmit suggestion, but the journal is not a good fit? Um, take the feedback and improve your paper and kindly tell the editor that you withdraw your manuscript and then you must start over somewhere else. But you have that feedback now and that is very, very valuable because those revisions that are requested in that revise and, and resubmit request will be made again if you do not revise those things. Um, so again, you can save yourself some time, take everything very seriously, um, address everything. Basically, revise your manuscript as if you were resubmitting to that journal before you go submit to the next journal. Um, but all you have to do to, to address the situation is simply let the editor know in your response that you would like to withdraw the manuscript and you can give a reason or you could not give a reason or that's your decision to withdraw your manuscript. Um, that is entirely within your control. Uh, you may run into an issue if you've accidentally stumbled upon a predatory journal and they may not get back to you and they may hold your manuscript up. Um, but if that's the case, you can tell the editor of the next journal what happened and that you have notified that previous journal that you withdraw your manuscript and that should take care of it. Uh, predatory journals, they can take your money but they can't hold your work hostage. Uh, if you're open and honest. So don't be embarrassed if something like that has happened to you. Uh, pick yourself up and move on. You can, you can get past that. That's great. Thank, thank you for that, Chrissy. Um, so our next question is, if I am a reviewer in a certain journal, uh, would it have any priorities to publish, or would there be any priorities to publish and accept my work in that journal? Um, no, <laughs> essentially, uh, at least for the journals that I've worked on, um, certainly, I think it would be fair to say that people that participate in a journal in a particular community um, will probably be given the benefit of the doubt uh, through the review process. So if a paper comes in and they've been a reviewer for that journal for 50 years, um, and you know, it might be borderline whether the paper gets reviewed or not, chances are it will move to review just out of courtesy to that person. But that would be the only thing I would say that that being a reviewer for a journal would give you that benefit. Um, there are lots of other benefits 
to being a reviewer, especially a good reviewer, you could find yourself on the editorial board, you could be recognized at the journal meetings for being a top reviewer, but having the, if I review for this journal, the publish my work is not something that I've seen in any of the journals that I've worked on. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the next question that we have is, what is the opinion of the panel about a no-fee journal in terms of quality? Um, how do I feel about a no-fee journal in terms of quality? I, I don't tend to equate the fee with the quality of the journal. Um, I think, however, the journal decides to handle their own processes, um, they can do that. Some journals are uh, financed by the societies who run them, and so they may not have a fee, uh, particularly for members of that society, there may not be a fee. Um, so I, would not, I wouldn't equate the fee with the quality of a journal. Um, I would assess the quality of that journal independently. And there are multiple metrics, not just impact factor. Um, that's, that's only one of them. So you can look at who's publishing in that journal. You can look at what's being published in that journal and, and who's citing it. Um, but, but yeah, journals have different, just as they have different workflow processes, they have different pricing structures. Um, but normally for an open access journal, you will see some sort of publication fee because they need to support their editorial processes. All of these steps that these lovely people go through and then, you know, are the editors go through to judge the peer reviews and make a decision that that needs support that needs financial support. So when a, when a journal requests money, it's not just for nothing. Uh, I have to say that, but a no fee journal, I wouldn't assume that it's low quality or high quality. I wouldn't assume anything. <laughs> Um, yes, so I would agree with Chrissy's opinion um, that certainly I think most open access journals are going to have a fee associated for the reasons that Chrissy mentioned. It's, you know, it costs something to produce a journal, but there are some that are smaller and more specialized that are maybe funded by the society or by other sources, so there could potentially be a high quality no fee journal, so I wouldn't discount it just on that factor alone. That's great, thank you. Um, the next question that we have, this person asks, is Beale's list 100% reliable um, on predatory journals? What, and what if a journal is indexed in uh, DOAJ that is listed in the journal's homepage, is it supposed to be a predatory journal? Um, so I can definitely say that Beale's list, no, is not 100% accurate. I think we've had a lot of um, questions come up about um, the methods that were used to determine um, the journals that were included on that list. So certainly I wouldn't take that as the be-all, end-all uh, decision. Um, you know, I, it's kind of a controversial topic within the industry, how much weight to give to that list. Um, it, there aren't really any other references that are like that, though, um, and I think some of the reasons why that list is problematic are also the reasons why there aren't other lists of that type. Um, so unfortunately, it's just really hard to really determine the final source on which journals are predatory and which aren't. It's something that you do kind of have to look at each individually and assess. I can add to that a little bit. I completely agree. And I think when you're looking at a journal, you have to look at all of the evidence. So maybe uh, uh, deals lists and things like that, their opinion, you can sort of equate them with rumor. Sometimes rumors, right? Sometimes rumors not. But you have to take other evidence into consideration 
before you make your own decision on how you feel about that journal. Look at everything um, that we that Pete talked about certainly today and, and weigh all of those. And a journal may have one or two of those indicators that make you think it's predatory, but it may not be predatory. So it really, um, it's the combination of things that happen um, to be going on at that journal and, and how it appears. Uh, if you're curious, ask your colleagues what they think of that journal uh, because they will uh, either not know about that journal and they'll, they'll start their own investigation or maybe they know something or have um, known someone who's published in there. So just do your research and um, try to make try to make the best decision uh, that you're comfortable with, I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, what do the panelists recommend about resubmitting a paper in the same journal? Should we choose a better one? So with the question, I guess it's unclear whether it's resubmit a paper that has been rejected to the same journal. Okay, so I think the one thing that I would certainly caution, and it's already been discussed by Jen with the, you know, sort of appeal letter idea, um, do not just resubmit without asking. So there are some journals that consider that an ethical violation and they will ban you from submitting again if you try to submit a paper that has previously been rejected without any sort of permission to do so. Um, I think that otherwise I would say that it varies on the journal. Um, I've seen plenty of papers that have come in from an appeal that have ended up getting accepted. So it's not, it's going to vary from journal to journal, but it's definitely not if you can make a really good case as to why it was misunderstood in a professional, clear way to the editors, um, you've saved yourself a little bit of time because it's already gone through one level of peer review and you've already been able to respond to those comments by going back to the same journal. At the same time, if you just want to cut your <laughs> cut ties and just move on, sometimes that's the better decision to make. It's just going to really depend on how extensive those comments are and what your interaction with the editors have, have been. Um, but editors, and I have my editor-in-chief for movement disorders likes to say he is not perfect and he makes mistakes. And so sometimes he does miss things um, and does change his mind. So it's certainly something to consider if you feel like you have a very good case. Great. We um, looks like we have two more questions, so I think um, that hopefully we have enough time for those. Um, the first question is: Is an impact factor of two to five okay? I think I should just give this to Julie. <laughs> so um, it. So impact factor, it's very hard to say if that is a good or bad impact factor because of the fields. So you can have a really, really good journal that has a one impact factor or a two impact factor because the field is so large um, and the, the spread of research goes across so many different journals. And then you can have a subspecialty journal with a 10 and in the rankings, that journal's just kind of middle of the road. It just depends on, on the field. Um, and I also would caution of doing the sort of uh, college ranking of universities based on impact factor because sometimes research belongs in a journal that might not have that super high impact factor because of all of the elements that we've talked about. Scope and impact in a subspecialty area might be greater in a, in a two, three, four impact factor than a five, six, just based on that. So, so it's really hard to say what is and is not good, just depending on, on the field. Anyone have anything else? Okay. To sum that up, the answer is ask your tenure committee. 
<laughs> right? Because so this this you know kind of the, well we sum it up as publish or perish, but for your own career advancement as a researcher or author, there are certain metrics at your institution that you have to meet. Um, and within your department. So we, we can't sit up here and tell you what those criteria are. And I think that's the driver behind that question is what impact factor is good. And it's what is your, what do your supervisors think is good and how are they going to judge your work? And I think as a, an author and researcher, the best that you can do is do the most sound research you possibly can with the resources you have at hand utilize your colleagues, utilize everything um, that's available to you to make that work good. And as Pete was trying to guide you, find the appropriate journal to disseminate your work. And you can have a separate conversation with your <laughs> academic committee about how they view the impact of this work. And I think really, I think that we, the industry needs to have a conversation about how that maybe needs to change to incentivize science a little bit differently. Um, but until then, all we can do is work within the system. But uh, yeah, impact factor is pretty subjective and it's, it means something different to everybody. And to some people, it doesn't mean anything. Um, so just keep that in mind. Great, thank you both. Um, and then our, our last question is, what is the usual extension for revision that is acceptable? Is it okay to ask for months instead of weeks or days? I probably have a better follow-up, but um, I, would, I would say if you, depending on the comments that you're getting back, uh, you can always say to the editor why I, I need this much time to address this issue. And I think certainly if they've given you a uh, very fast, just minor revision situation, and maybe the reviewer has actually requested something kind of significant, you may actually request the editor to say, can I, can I revise this and actually resubmit it as a new manuscript because it looks like I'm going to have a lot of work to do. Um, so timeline is kind of relative, but usually the journal will give you a timeline. If you need more than that, you definitely need to communicate with the editor as quickly as possible. So maybe they can put your manuscript in a different category because if you stay in the same category and you miss that deadline, you're out of the loop on that submission. So you want to stay, you want to keep your submission active unless that the most appropriate thing is for you to withdraw and resubmit a new version later. I would say that with most of the journals that I've worked on, they're really flexible when you're talking in terms of weeks. Um, so one week, two week, three weeks, typically nobody bats an eye. That's handled by the managing editor or the editorial assistant, and that's just granted. Um, anything more than that is going to likely have to go to the editor, and then that that's at their discretion. So I think that you're safer um, if you need more time of just kind of functioning within that weeks. Now that, again, is journal specific. Some editors might be pickier, but in my experience, if you just need a little bit more time, it's better to ask for a week or two than a month or two. All right. Well, thank you for your questions. And if anyone local wants to stick around to ask a few more, um, we'll be meeting for a little social hour. Uh, but for all of you who contributed in our um, international audience online, thank you so much. And I hope to see you again in another panel discussion. <laughs>